Okay, let's continue our work on the uh, flow of water through soil. side you have the dam 
and there is no water on this side, the water goes underneath the dam and then comes up on this side. That's the case of upward flow. And we'll have to be careful that in this zone where the water is coming up, uh, we don't run into this condition, we'll have to put a factor of safety against this quicksand condition <coughs> uh, so that we don't have a dam that starts sinking because here we have no effect of stress. So we go back to the, uh, the simple test where we have a soil sample back to the, the test, the, the constant head parameter, and then in the uh, source sample we have water flowing, so we have water at this level here, and we maintain this level constant, and so the water comes down this way, comes out here, and overflows here with a flow Q. And then the soil sample is right here, and this is sand. Okay. The distances are, this distance is going to be right here. This will be the length of the sample L, and this will be the distance h. If we write that the uh, uh, so here is point A, if we write that the effect of stress at A is equal to zero, that's how we create the quick condition. So let's calculate the effective stress at A. Total stress at A minus water stress at A. Sigma prime A equals zero. What is the total stress at A? Well, this material has a saturated unit weight, gamma seven, and, and the, the length is L, so the total stress is going to be gamma saturated times L. What is the water pressure or water stress at A? By definition, it's the pressure head at A times gamma W. Okay, it's no longer because the water is flowing, so you cannot use hydrostatic laws. In this case, we have to evaluate the pressure head at A. And you remember pressure head at A, I've got to find a standpipe of clear water connected to A that goes to a free water level. So in this case, the water pressure at A is gamma W times L plus H. So if I rewrite this equation, I'm going to have gamma saturated times L equal uh, gamma W L plus gamma W H. And what's of interest to me is the uh, hydraulic gradient because once I have the hydraulic gradient I multiply by K and I'll know how fast the water has to go. So what I need to form is H divided by L because H is the loss of total head between A and B. Uh, and so H over L, I divide by L. Uh, so this disappears, this disappears, this is H over L. So I've got gamma saturated minus gamma W divided by gamma W. So that's uh, gamma saturated about 20 kilonewton per cubic meter, gamma W about 10, 20 minus 10 over 10. This is usually uh, in the neighborhood of 1. And the hydraulic, so we call this the critical 
hydraulic gradient is equal to H uh, uh, over L because H is the loss of total head between A and B because the total head A is pressure head plus if I choose the datum right here, then uh, there is zero elevation head, and this is the pressure head. And then the total head at B is zero pressure head, because there is no, you're at the surface of the water, plus L being the elevation head. So H plus L minus L, this gives me the uh, loss of total head between A and B. And then this is the distance uh, 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 between A and B. So this is the MS saturated, so the critical gradient will be gamma saturated minus gamma W, and we will have to calculate, you know, back to the story about the dam and the water coming back up this way, upward flow, critical condition, we will have to calculate the hydraulic gradient here and make sure that it's quite a bit less than this uh, magic uh, critical value of about one. And typically we aim for something around 0.25, so we put a significant uh, factor of safety against this uh, value of one. <clears throat> so back to the movies, uh, you know, when you see people that go into those quicksands, um, you know, they sink, because the soil has turned into a liquid. The uh, effective stress is zero, uh, but this liquid is uh, pretty heavy. Um, and before I get there, let me ask you this. Do you know your unit weight? Uh, you know, we, we, we typically know our weight. We get on the scale and then we measure our weight and, and uh, we try to control that. But that's another story. Uh, so you have your weight, but you don't know your volume, typically. You know, and if you want to know your volume, well, you got to go into a large container full of water, and then you you jump in there and then displace it. Now you know your volume. But you know, we there are some ways of doing that. Uh, but we do know our unit weight approximately, and the reason we do is that you know if you go into a swimming pool. Some people sink, some people float, but most of the time we're right about, you know, the, the, the floating point. So our unit weight is very similar to the unit weight of water. So we're around 10. So back to you fall into a quicksand. Your unit weight is 10 kilonewtons per cubic meter. What is the unit weight of the quicksand? Well, it certainly has no strength. But the unit weight of the quicksand is gamma saturated. How much is gamma saturated? About 20 kilonewton per cubic meter. So as a human being, you fall in the quicksand, you have a unit weight of 10 kilonewton per cubic meter, and the quicksand has a unit weight of 20 kilonewton per cubic meter. How far are you going to sink? Well, because of the buoyancy law, you should sink to about half your volume. So don't panic, <laughs> you just go in there and wait till you're about halfway through and that should bring balance uh, and, and you should read equilibrium in, in that case, if you believe in the theory. <laughs> yes. um, the, the problem is if you start shaking and oh panic, oh my goodness, you know, trying to grab at something. You, there's a fair amount of friction on the side of your body and you have zero bearing capacity under your feet. So uh, you can only go down, you cannot go back up. Uh, so don't panic and then uh, and hopefully the theory is right. So that's the quicksand condition. <coughs> the next, next topic I wanted to cover was, and I'll start on this side here, was the problem of multi-layer flow. So multi-layer flow, everything we've done so far 
as being one layer, one uniform soil. But often in, in uh, nature, you have one layer and another layer. And so uh, we'll start actually with the flow, we'll do the flow in the horizontal direction. So let's say that you have two layers, layer one and layer two. And they have different thicknesses. So this is H1, this is H2, and then we're going to flow the water in the horizontal direction. So this is the flow in the horizontal direction. And the question is, how do we handle this uh, from an equivalent uniform soil point of view? So then, in this case, we're going to write uh, that the flow, the, the flow Q here, is the flow in the, fl in the first layer, Q1, plus the flow in the second layer. I mean, they're adding some of the water goes here, and so we have Q equals Q1 plus Q2. But Q1 uh, is equal to, uh, remember this, Q equals VA. So we're going to write that Q1 is equal to V1 A1. What is A1? Well, A1 is the cross-section area that the flow in layer 1 is facing. So this area is H1I, and we're going to take a unit distance perpendicular to the border, V1 H1 times 1, and then Q2, same thing, V2 H2 times 1 perpendicular uh, uh, to that direction. So then, uh, this is the, the equivalent flow, and I'm going to write <coughs> that if I combine VA, you know, I could write here, if you wish, I could continue by using the second Darcy's Law, I can write that I have KIA. Alright, so I'm going to rewrite Q1 and Q2. Q is going to be K equivalent. I equivalent. A is going to be H1 plus H2. And then times 1 perpendicular to the board. And this is going to be equal to K1 I1 H1 times 1 plus K2 I2 H2 times 1. Now, the, uh, the hydraulic gradient uh, let me go to that page in here. The hydraulic gradient um, is loss of total head between two points divided by the length travel. So in this case, um, so let me go to, pay, I'm on page 381. Uh, 381 here. So the the total head, the loss of total head between two points. If I take two points here, I take point A and point B, and the flow flows from. So I've got total head at A and total head at B. And you can see that the hydraulic gradient is the same in both layers. In other words, here I can write that 
I equivalent is equal to I1 is equal to I2 is equal to HT, uh, HTA, which is highest because that's when the uh, water has more energy, minus HTB divided by the length between A and B. Okay, so the hydraulic gradients are the same, and so they cancel out here, and I end up with the equation for the uh, equivalent uh, permeability, K equivalent, is going to be K1 H1 plus K2 H2 divided by H1 plus H2. Okay, so that's the equivalent permeability in the case of horizontal flow in a two layer system. And then you could extend this to uh, a lot more layers. But that's, uh, and then you can handle the problem with the equivalent permeability and the equivalent gradient uh, rather than having to do it in each layer. Let me go back here and deal with the case now where the flow where the flow is in the vertical direction because you know, back to the dam the water is coming down, here it's flowing horizontally, here it's flowing upward, here it's flowing downward, so you could face a flow vertical and a flow horizontal. So second case, we have again two layers. So layer one is right here, layer two is right there, and uh, so this is the thickness, this is H1, H2. The only difference now is that the flow is in this direction. Flow, and the flow is Q. So the flow goes through this, uh, in this direction, and we're going to consider uh, a length or width L over which uh, the flow. So you can see that the, the cross-section area, that A value here is going to be L times 1 when we write the equations. All right, so we don't need this anymore. So let's go and, and write the equations. This time, you see that you have Q1 in here and Q2 in the second layer. This is the distance, L. Yeah. And you can see that Q1 is equal to Q2 because the sort is saturated, it's like being on a big highway and uh, the cars are all over the place on all the lanes and they're all going at the same speed uh, in this one and at the different speed in this one because uh, we're going to have a different permeability in those, in those uh, two things. Maybe I, didn't, I should have put here that this has a permeability K1 and this has a permeability K2. So same here, this uh, layer 1 has a permeability K1 and this layer 2 has a permeability uh, K2. So in this case, the, uh, the flows are the same, uh, whereas in this case, the flows were additive. The, uh, the, uh, the difference here is that the total heads are going to be additive. So the flow will be the same, but the total head uh, will be additive. So if we write the equations, then we start by saying that Q uh, is equal to Q1 is equal to Q2. So that means that uh, Ki 
that means that k equivalent times i equivalent times a l times 1 l times 1 is equal to q1 k1 i1 l times 1 plus k2 i2 times l times 1 Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, not plus, equal here. Okay, the flow is conserved, so they're all equal to each other. What is additive in this case is the loss of total head. So the loss of total head, if I pick a point, uh, let me put it in the uh, so A will be here now, and B will be here. So when I go from A to B, I lose delta H, delta H, T, A, B. And that's the, uh, that I, I lose that by losing sum in the first layer plus sum in the second layer. So I've got to write this. Delta H T one plus delta H T two. You know, you're, you're taking your first highway and you're burn, burning so much gasoline. You take a second highway and you're burning additional gasoline. So the loss, you know, how much you're burning total is uh, the addition of those uh, two things. So you can. Uh, and again, I'm on page, uh, let's see, 382. So then if I write that, uh, uh, if I write that delta HT, I want to write that delta HT1 is equal to uh, I1 times the uh, length travel, so that's H1. Okay? And then I2 will have the same equation for delta H2 is going to be I2 times H2. And then the equivalent one, the total, will be HT equals I equivalent H1 plus H2. So I can replace these uh, two things in there, <clears throat> and that will give me an equation. I'll, I, I won't go through the detail. I'll just give you, you can go back to uh, that. Uh, so I end up with K equivalent in this case equals. Uh, H1 plus H2 divided by H1 over K1 plus H2 over K2. And you could extend that equation to uh, more layers. You have the general equation in the. You, should, you don't have to know the, that equation, nor, nor this one here. You do have to know the red ones on the left here. These are critically important and could be questions in the uh, short part of the uh, of the midterm. Okay, so that's uh, how we handle the uh, multi-layer systems, and I think it's a good practice because it shows you how the flows are adding or the flows are constant or the same, and then how to uh, add or uh, consider these uh, loss of, of total bit. Let me switch now to a, another topic, which is uh, the, the topic of um, the, uh, the two-dimensional flow. So we're, we're going from the simplest case where we had uh, uni-dimensional flow Unidimensional flow through a uniform sort. There was the, uh, you know, when we measured the, the, the tests, uh, constant head permeameter 
falling head from here under. And then we went through multi-layered systems. But still in this case, the flow is unidimensional, it's one direction. Okay? Either in this way, that way, but it's uh, in one direction. Now we need to look at something that's closer to reality where we have two-dimensional flows. And again, that's coming back to the dam problem where the water can turn the corner and now you have Z and X as the two components of uh, flow. So uh, th this is the, uh, uh, now we're dealing with the problem of two-dimensional flow of water through soil. So far it was one dimensional, now we're dealing with uh, two dimensional flow. And anytime you try to solve a, a problem that's a bit difficult like this, uh, there are a certain number of steps that you, in engineering, that you always follow, be it geotech, hydraulics, structures, uh, it, you, you always follow these basic steps to, to try to solve a problem. The first one is to list your assumptions. Uh, you're trying to solve the problem. So what we're talking about, before I go to the assumptions, uh, we're trying to solve a, a problem. Uh, let me see. Uh, maybe I can. We'll, we'll continue to use the dam uh, as an example. So here we have a dam, earth dam, and uh, there is an impervious layer at some depth. So this is uh, impervious. And then we have the water on this side. And then we're going to make sure that we capture that water, water within the dam through a tow drain. Now we're going to put a big drain here with coarse particles uh, and so this will be because basically the water is lazy and doesn't want to do, it wants to always aim for the minimum effort. And so this water is going to be attracted toward this low potential here and it's going to start to flow probably something like this. All right. So overall, the water uh, is, so the, the soil starts here, soil here, soil here. This is water. This is like a lake, a big lake. And the flow of water is going this way, and this way, and this way. <coughs> so right here, we have water, and here we have water, here we have water. And we wish to know what's happening at a random point inside the soil. So we need to so that by what, what what I mean by what's happening, we want to know what is the uh, total head, pressure head, elevation head, hydraulic gradient, uh, uh, effective stress. We want to know all this in the uh, inside the dam or underneath the dam. And you know, we just talked uh, earlier about the up uh, gradient, uh, the uplift uh, force, the, the quick condition that would take place here. So here the effective stress would increase, here the effective stress would decrease, and we don't want that dam to sag uh, downward in this case, so we'll put a factor of safety on the hydraulic gradient that's here. But we're trying to find out uh, what is happening anywhere in this mass, and it could be at uh, this point, this point, I want to take a random element, say right here, and we'll call that point M. So that's what we're trying to solve. Finding out all those quantities at point M, a random point in the soil mass. The first thing to do, as I mentioned earlier, is what are we assuming? So first, assumption. 
And the assumptions we're going to say first, the soil is saturated. So the degree of saturation equal one, there's water everywhere, and that makes sense. Right? That seems uh, reasonable. Two, uh, Darcy's law applies. Okay, V equals Ki. And, and, you know, Darcy did his work in the late 1800s, and we've been using it for 150 years, and we haven't uh, really found anything better. So, that, again, that, that seems to be reasonable. All right, I'm on page, let me see. Uh, 377. 377. All right. Assumptions. Um, the soil is uniform. Soil is uniform. So we're not talking about the, these types of condition. That whole thing is uh, uniform soil. Four, uh, the flow is in two directions only. Flow in two directions only. Five, the flow is independent of time. That's what we call steady state flow. Okay, so these are the assumptions that we're making <coughs> to try to solve this problem, and they're all uh, reasonable. The two-dimensional flow means it goes in this direction or that direction or combination thereof, but there's no flow perpendicular to the board. Uh, and independent of time, in other words, if you take a picture on Monday morning and on Tuesday morning, you get the same picture. Okay, there is no change. Uh, that's called steady state flow. Later on in the course, we will see unsteady states or transient flow where things become a little bit more complicated. All right, so these are the assumptions and now let me take you through the, the basic steps. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a reasonably complicated uh, problem. And any time you have a complicated problem in engineering, the, the basic reflex is to zoom in at the element level. We say, well, look, you know, there are things, all kinds of things happening all over the place. Let me zoom in at the element level, random element. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to M, and we're looking at what's happening at M. So we have the two directions, Z and X. And we're going to try to use you know, those equations, because that's all we have. Um, and just thinking of the, the general process uh, first. Um, so one, we zoom in at the element level. Two, we identify all the unknowns that we're interested in on that element. Three, we write fundamental equations, you know, the ones that are true no matter what. In our case, for flow, it's going to be conservation of mass. Q equals VA. Whatever comes in has to come out. You know, there's no, nothing happening in between. Uh, and then we use the constitutive laws, the ones that say for this material, this is what how it's going to behave, and in our case, it's going to be Darcy's law. And then we regroup everything, and because this is dz and this is dx, then we end up with elemental distances when we regroup all these equations. And that means that we end up with a differential equation, one or more. And that's the governing differential equation. 
Well, that's why differential equations are important to us in engineering, because when we try to solve these problems, we zoom in at the element level, and boom, suddenly dz, dx, dy appear, and therefore we end up with uh, differential equations. And then we go to the math department and say, look, here is the, the equation, please uh, solve that equation so that we can uh, get our engineering problem. All right, so, uh, and, and then, then after that, once we have the differential equation, uh, we have to apply the boundary conditions. And sometimes the differential equation is not too complicated, but the boundary conditions are complicated, and that, that makes a mess. Or the differential equation is complicated, and the boundary conditions are quite simple, and that's still difficult. And then it could have a differential equation that's tough, and some tough boundary condition, and that's basically when we go to uh, numerical simulations, finite element, finite difference, and, and techniques like this. Back to the problem. So we're going to follow those steps. Number one, remember, zoom in at the element level. So we're at the element level, and we want to identify uh, the quantities that are important to us, and, and that is the water velocity. So we've got, uh, this is V, Z. Uh, and then coming in on this side of the element, we have Vx. And so this distance here is dx, and this distance here is dz. And we'll take one perpendicular to the, as we've done before, one unit length perpendicular to the, to the board. Now coming out in this direction, uh, the velocity has changed. Why? Because it's hard for the water to go through these, uh, these soil grains and there is loss of energy. So the velocity has changed and Vx uh, is no longer Vx, but Vx plus a little bit, minus. And a little bit mathematically is expressed as dVx dx dx. Okay, the slope times the length over which you, you travel. And then same here, we've got velocity coming out, and this is going to be Vz plus dVz dz, dz, okay? So we've identified these quantities, and now we can start writing our fundamental equation, our constitutive equation, and then see uh, what, what happens to the problem. So, uh, conservation of mass. That means that whatever comes, whatever water comes in the element, because the element is saturated, uh, anything that comes in has to come out. So what comes in? Well, I've got Vz, Q equals Va. So Va, what's A? Dx times 1. Vz, Dx times 1 plus what comes in on the x side, plus Vx times uh, dz times 1. Okay, that's what comes in. So we're going to write basically that Q in equals Q out. Well, that's Q in. What comes out? Well, I've got Vx, or we'll, we'll do dz, uh, plus dvz dz, dz, uh, that's the velocity, times flowing through dx times 1, so times dx times 1, plus on the x side, I've got vx plus dvx, dx, dx. times the area, VA, so the area is goes through DZ times 1, okay? So that leads, and you can see how we're leading to a differential equation because we've got these DZ, DX floating all over the place. Uh, if you regroup all this, you can see that the VZ, DX is going to cancel, the VX, DZ is going to cancel, and I'm left with dvz, dz, uh, dz, 
dx plus the other term that's not uh, cancelling, dvx dx dx dz equals zero. So the dx dz uh, cancels and then end up with dvz dz plus dvx dx equals zero. So, so far we've used the fundamental equation. Now we can replace V by Ki. And so I is going to be defined, uh, let's see, I don't want to erase this, maybe I'll jump over to this side, erase the assumptions. So then I'm going to write that Vx is equal to k i x and so that's uh, k uh, times loss of total head over the distance traveled which is dx in the x direction, this is an x dx uh, so I guess I should not put delta ht but dht because now I'm at the uh, differential level so the uh, dht dx I've got vz equals k i z so k is the same because one of the assumptions was the sort is uniform and this is going to be k dht dz and ht is the same because the total head is a unique value it's the energy that the water the global energy that the water has to be able to flow and flow the rest of the way to the downstream phase okay so then i replace these expression of vx and vz into this equation and i end up with uh, so i got to take the derivative of this with respect to, uh, let's see, oh, this one, okay, so VZ, so I've got to form DVZ DZ, that's going to be K D2HT DZ squared, so I'm going to have uh, K D2HT DZ squared, uh, plus, and I've got to differentiate this with respect to X, so that's going to be D2HT dx squared, so plus k d2ht uh, dx squared equals zero. Okay, that's this equation. So the k uh, drops out, simplifies, and I end up with d2ht dx squared, or dz squared, plus d2ht uh, dx squared equal 0. Before I go any further, uh, what it, you know, when you write uh, derivatives, this is the second derivative of the, of the uh, total head. We put the 2 here and the 2 there. You say, well, why, why is that? Well, if I write dht dx, that means a small increment of ht divided by a small increment of dx. So this is uh, meters and this is meters. So dht over dx, meter over meter, is non dimensional. d2ht is also a little piece of ht. But dx squared is the square of the small distance dz. So the units of this are meters over meter squared. So this expression here, the units are 1 over meter. And, and you can check dimensional 
dimensionally if your equations are correct by looking at uh, the dimensions of so this is called uh, Laplace equation it's a form Laplace with a French guy a pretty smart fellow and uh, he, uh, he looked into these equations there are harmonic functions that are a so solution of this but this equation is the one we have to solve so we can find what is HT at M in that in uh, randomly in the flow and uh, we solve that equation by a graphical solution called flow nets so the flow nets uh, the flow net is a graphical solution to the governing differential equation of the two-dimensional flow. And in the next lecture, we will talk about how to draw the flow net and then calculations associated with the flow net. But that's the, again, graphical solution to this governing differential equation. All right, we'll see you next time.